Rolling. Rolling. How you doing, mate? I'm doing good. How you going? Yeah, doing all right. What are we good on? Here. Episode number four. Didn't we say we weren't going to, or we were going to say it for a few more episodes? For a couple more episodes, and yeah. then we'll probably have to drop it. Yeah, we will. We'll get complaints in the comments. We will. Um, so <laughs> I was catching up with um, Mandalorian season two which I don't get to spend much time consuming content in my delicious studio, but I am doing my best to try and keep on top of what's going on and be able to listen to things because it's just an an enjoyable experience to listen in my studio. So it's partly why I wanted to build it so I could enjoy content as well. But, um, yeah, so I was watching Mandalorian and I just wanted to kind of ask you what your thoughts were on Star Wars and, you know, obviously Disney bought them out a while ago now and have been creating so much new content, whether it's new films and a whole bunch of TV series, exploring the different stories like Obi-Wan and Solo. And uh, I just wanted to know, like, obviously you're a big Star Wars fan, right? Um, I do like Star Wars, yeah. I'm a big sci-fi fan. Yeah, so yeah. generally speaking, if it's sci-fi, I'm into it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, Star Wars is no exception there. Yeah, that's it. So. so what are your thoughts on the fact that Disney bought it and have really expanded on it? Uh, mm. Do you think that was a good thing for Star Wars? It's a great question because I know it's created a lot of controversy on uh, in around the fans of Star Wars. I am for it. I, I say the more um, entertainment in this genre, um, the better. Um, I enjoy the Star Wars story. I like the characters. I like the the music and the production design. Um, and I like the quality um, that the production team um, create on this story as well. And, and Disney, out of all the different companies that you could want to take on, you know, a franchise or a, or a, a series of stories, they know how to make a thing good. So, yeah, um, yeah I'd say I'm, I'm for it. And I've been enjoying all these spin-offs as well. So um, all these other stories with new characters or characters that were part of the original Star Wars story, but just a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, I'm I'm also in the for it camp because I've had some decent conversations with people and even like for particular movies and they trash, you know, certain stories within, you know, or, um, plot holes or whatever and they kind of complain about it. But at the end of the day, I'm like, just give me more. I love Star Wars. It's obviously yeah. such a huge part of my upbringing and all the same reasons you love it, like from, you know, John Williams's score, they've just uh, taken things like that to just whole new levels, like not in, in, in a bigger level but just different varieties and stuff. They've brought in so many great composers and just the sound of Star Wars from the start, you know, even though it was made so mm. long ago, it was, it was massive and they've just done such a great job of, uh, giving us a modern spin on that and using technology the way it was meant to be, you know, like, um, so yeah, I, I'm uh, again, hundred percent for it. And I'm like, give it, give me as much as you want. And <laughs> even if the quality is not always really amazing when it comes to the story or whatever, I just, I, I leave the experience every time just buzzing. Uh, and then when people talk to me, oh, well, what about, you know, this scene or this way they took the, the story? I think one example was, um, was one in one of the latest, uh, I can't remember which one it was, where they went to the casino and there's these weird creatures they race, like horse racing and stuff. And uh, it was totally just an addition to this story that what didn't need to be there. But uh, like mm. I don't, you know, now I look back on the, that extra scene, I'm like, yeah, all right. So maybe it wasn't great and it really just didn't need to be there. But I'm like when I'm sitting in the cinema taking it all in, I'm just like, oh, more Star Wars characters and great fight scenes or chase scenes and the sounds are great and the music's great. I just lap it up. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely, definitely think Disney's done some really great stuff and, and even seeing all these stories fleshed out, like, you know, for a lot of people, you know, there's now come out with Boba Fett's story as well. Like these are some characters mm. that you didn't see a lot of, as you said, but people were like, you know, they're one of their favorite characters to buy the toy of was like Boba Fett. Cause he's just cool and mysterious. Um, so the fact they've, you know, really fleshed out these stories is really cool. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, very much keen for it all. Um, talking about, um, Mandalorian, like you, have, it, have you, you've seen the first season? Um, yeah, like what, what do you think overall of the, of the experience of Mandalorian? Yeah, 
It's a good question. And I guess Mandalorian being a um, streaming service um, a TV show, uh, I experienced it just here in my lounge room yeah. um, on my hi-fi system. And um, I liked it. I liked it for a few reasons. Um, I liked the continuation, obviously, of Star Wars genre. Um, and I liked discovering uh, Ludwig Göransson, if that's how you say his name, yeah. the composer yeah. who who did the themes and uh, scored the first two seasons, I believe, um, with him and his team. But um, so I, I wasn't um, aware of his work prior to that. So that was a discovery of his work. And even just from the first moment of the first episode, I just thought I had a smile on my face straight away. I was like, all right, I need to find out who's writing this tune because yeah, yeah. Uh, it's cool. Yeah. It's a lot of cool sounds, uh, really interesting melodies. And um, Well, for me, uh, like, so with the first season, the one thing that I didn't appreciate of, of the show itself was that it was a bit rinse and repeat when it came to the episodes. And I think a few people felt the same way you know, each episode was he goes to a place, helps him do the thing to kind of get to where he's going and stuff. And it felt a bit mm. same, same as the episodes went on. Obviously, each one had some different elements that made it cool. But what I appreciated of, or have been appreciating for the second season is at least for the, the handful of episodes I've seen, it didn't feel that same, same. Like they had a bit more of a larger story arc. Well, they did that in the first one with him, you know, with Baby Yoda and stuff. But um, I definitely think that the second season is kind of, you know, story-wise capturing me a, a fair bit more. Uh, it's interesting, like the thing that I'm loving actually and even in TV in general with, say, Netflix and stuff is they're really like you're getting feature film quality, you know, particularly mm -hmm. audio. This is We mostly talk audio but like this, the sounds in these films, you know, in these TV shows and stuff is of a film quality and that, like – they're obviously smaller budgets, although fortunately for us, Disney's got a pretty decent budget and have decent teams for this sort of stuff. But the quality of the the audio is just phenomenal when it comes to the sound design and all that sort of stuff. Um, they're very full sounding soundtracks, lots of Foley. And, and obviously this being a Star Wars show, their back catalogue would be so good, like as in their oh, sound library. So many sounds. Yeah. And Disney, Disney themselves separately from the Star Wars and, you know, production companies pinch sounds from different shows all the time and hide them in and hope that the everyday person doesn't realise. But um, the catalogue of co of usable sounds that they would have in their studios, the hardest thing I think would be to actually to sift through the sounds and decide on a sound. <laughs> As someone who's a music writer myself and sometimes we can get lost in sample libraries, which kick sound do I want for this song and you find yourself 45 minutes later still listening to different sounds, I can't, can't imagine um, yeah. sifting well, through that kind of catalogue. We probably should be careful and, and uh, preface that they may be recording a lot of brand new sounds, but the fact that they have, uh, I guess, the what would you say? It's like their, their Bible of, you know, the originals and how they sounded. And so even if they are re-recording a lot of that stuff and, you know, because these days they're going to Atmos and they might be trying to bring new things to it. But, you know, at the end of the day, they've got this, uh, a guidebook in the, especially in the original three. And, you know, any, any in, uh, interview I've seen of like the sound guys talking about doing the later films, they talk about a lot of how their old sounds were created and the fact they, you know, mm. would have redone or reused those ideas and stuff. So um, they may have re-recorded it. So I feel bad if we're saying, oh, yeah, they're just pulling from old libraries. But at the end of the day, for saving time, for particularly for a TV show like this, they probably are using a lot of their their catalogue of sounds. But uh, I'd say it's a bit of both. Yeah. You know, there'd be new sounds created that they needed um, yeah. to, to bring into this new world and and they'd have their staples that they know work really well. Yeah. Um, Let's I, hope I, don't, I, you I haven't done any specific research on that, yeah, yeah, so I neither. can't tell you that that is exactly what they've done, but yeah. um, I just know that it's a common practice for production companies to, you know, reuse sounds where they, where um, they can. Where yeah. they can. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. hope that they listen to this interview between you or conversation with you and me and then tell us off in the comments because that would be <laughs> as in the sound That would be, be fantastic. Going, yeah, please tell us off in the comments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you have to have worked on the film. <laughs> Don't be just some random dude telling us off. <laughs> oh, to see even if you're some random dude, go on, tell us off. Yeah, yeah. Fun. <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, so the yeah. score, like oh, I totally agree. The opening theme was just glorious. Um, but, yeah, have you got any thoughts on – 
or what were you saying sort of about um, – uh, like the instruments and stuff or like what mm. kind of sounds was Ludwig pulling that you found interesting? Yeah, I really liked the woodwind um, melody, which is quite an odd choice. Like my first thought was that's a really interesting choice. Um, and I did a bit uh, – after watching the first few episodes, um, like a couple of days later, I went on to, online to try and research and find out more about it and more about him and uh, learned that he um, uh, used like a, a, a orchestral recorder um, yeah, like a bass a baritone, a, yeah, baritone bass or recorder, bass recorder, yeah. yeah. So, which was really, really um, interesting. I haven't heard much music made from a bass recorder yeah. or even a recorder. Yeah. You know, the, the instrument that we all learned in school and yeah. and no one really uses for anything. Uh, what is that? Is that musical? just an Australian thing, or do you? Is it like I would be interested to That's know good, if yeah. internationally because I, I was the same. We weren't at the same school, but recorder seemed to be that instrument. And I don't – maybe because it's easier to play in the sense of it's not like a readed instrument, but it seems like an odd instrument to just make everyone – Just blow learn. air through it and yeah. put your fingers better on than the a gaps. Better than kazoo where you just, you know, pitch with your voice basically. I think um, if, if your music teacher gave you a kazoo to go practice at home, <laughs> your parents would uh, – do things they're not allowed to do. <laughs> yeah, that's good. But um, no, the, the score was really interesting because it was like a combination of orchestral elements that you would expect to hear in a in a Star Wars story. Obviously this bass recorder that held the main melody but played in this really um, uh, interesting way. Like it was these, co- these figures that were moving up and down in scale but they were kind of repeated so they were sort of um, – but they, they kind of had this like – breathy, unworldly sound yeah. to them, which was quite cool. Yeah. Um, and also um, like a very simple drum rhythm that felt very tribal, very yeah. um, ancestral. Well, um, the, the, they did say that the film was – or the show was meant to be kind of like a Western – I saw in the interview where they talked it was uh, all based off like samurai films as well. But it did have mm, that Western vibe. The Like you could dum, da, da, dum. You could picture him riding on a horse – Although he, he rides, he rides, you know, in, in the opening scenes, I think of the first season, isn't he riding a big, some sort of big beast? And it's yep, got that, creature. you know, you could just picture, um, you know, some gunslinger, which is what he is, he's a gun or a blaster uh, slinger. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it definitely, he's captured that kind of um, Western film vibe. Uh, which is really cool. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So I saw in this interview with him, they talked about like obviously this guy, uh, well, not obviously, but um, Ludwig uses a lot of synths and stuff when he was writing it. And he took you, you could watch a video on YouTube. um, I think you've seen the same one where he talks about the, you know, different instruments. He's played some stuff on guitar, piano, and obviously like they transpose that or uh, arrange that into more of a score. But, when I was listening to the opening track again in my room, unfortunately it wasn't in Atmos. It was only stereo, which I find odd because oh, interesting the show's mixed in Atmos, but they didn't mix the score in Atmos um, or spatial audio. But the uh, – what was the same? But, the, yeah, some of the elements of like the synths and stuff are still in there, um, mm. either assisting the uh, orchestra or, you know, a sound on their own as well, which is cool. Mm. That's that brings me to a question. So if you're list, if you're listening to in your studio a, a score that's just stereo, what happens in a seven point one system? Does it just come through the, the left right speakers, yeah. or does it do some up mixing? And well, I can. A- so I've I've currently like I have different settings, so I can listen to it direct, which will give me whatever it is the source. I can listen to it in stereo. 7.1 or Dolby Atmos, which I don't have the ceiling speakers at the moment, so it's only 7.1 that I'm listening mm. to, but I can get it to up mix. And it does generally what a normal decoder would for that where it pushes anything that's not kind of transient, which is mm-hmm. the, uh, I guess to layman's terms, is like the actual drum hit itself or like the sharp sound tends to be at the front and then the reverbs or tails tend to go to the back. So if there's a reverb. So it'll, it'll look for ambiences yeah, in, in this, and different in the, things yeah, like that. Anything that's um, yeah, not okay. sort of as sharp, which it does that. If you're watching any stereo uh, film, it'll put the dialogue in the centre channels, whatever's left to right in left and right, and then any low frequencies, anything under like 80 hertz will go to the sub, and then anything reverby tends to just get mm. dragged to the back. So it'll do something like that 
Uh, but I didn't actually listen to it in that. I listened to it in stereo because that's what it came in. Fortunately for me, my decoder that I use uh, can just pull it as it is and it tells you on the screen when something starts. When content starts, it'll say what the bit rate is and then also what format it is. So if it's 5.1 and in here it's great. It does good upmixing of the 5.1 into amp, um, 7.1 or Atmos as well. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, it was. that's interesting because I've been listening to the score a lot um, just on Apple Music, um, but didn't realize it wasn't Atmos because I don't have Atmos or Surround at my, in my space. So obviously they have it in lossless. Um, yep. So yeah, I saw if that. you watched our last episode, you'll learn how to turn that on and, and appreciate the high quality. But um, uh, just in my space, uh, it's, it's a glorious, um, pr- like the production quality of the score is really cool. Um, yeah. the, I, I did notice a difference between season one and season two. Um, and season three, in, the, in fact. And season three, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Really takes it to the next level um, from a production quality, the sound of the instruments, the recording and the mix, um, especially in, in season three. Um, which isn't actually is, out yet, right? So it's just the score that they've released, correct? I'm which pretty is, sure yeah, that's, the third I think so. I, um, I, uh, it was a little while ago that I watched the um, Mandalorian um and obviously just watched a couple of episodes just recently. But, yeah, I haven't seen season three come out, but it's often that the um, soundtrack album or the original score album yeah. will come out before the episodes yeah, for of all of teaser. us music nerds to, yeah. to listen to and then um, be able to hum along. Yeah. Um, but not not to intentionally skip season two, but season three, um, uh, you know, I've just been listening to it this afternoon and um, – there's some really great sounds in there. Um, a lot of really cool textural landscapes. Um, I'm, it actually makes me really excited to see what season three will be. It sounds really dark, yeah, like it's a musically, bit heavier, so yeah, a bit it? heavier, a bit darker. Yeah. So I reckon it might be getting like I know it's Disney, but they may have found their tough side. Maybe yeah. I'm hoping so. We'll see. Yeah. Um, I always love. What do you think? Actually, the um, I remember seeing a trailer for one of the latest ones. It, um, mm. it was I don't know if it was episode seven or eight. And the score in the trailer, they released a, like uh, a darker version of one of the main themes of Star Wars. And I, I went back and tried to find the trailer again because I remember, I, maybe I remember it in my head, <laughs> it being a different track, but I scoured the internet for that trailer again because I, I just wanted to hear, I have no idea who composed that trailer track because a lot of times the composer of a trailer s- score is different to the actual score of the film. But yeah. it was just like I can't remember which theme it was. It, this is the problem. I couldn't even remember. I left there after it. seeing the whatever the film was that I went to see. I was just like, oh, what is this score? Because it was just should have used Shazam. Yeah, I should have. Because no, you? I didn't. I did not. Because I just love like any, for me hearing like Star Wars go dark and heavy, almost like mm. Hans Zimmer version of Star Wars was yeah, really it was really cool. Um, yeah, I noticed that because um, when we were talking about the uh, listening to the, the score of the um, season three, is that the um, Joseph Shirley is that they've got a new composer for the third, and after doing some research, they obviously him and Ludwig work together quite a bit. Um, so they, I, I did some research on both of them as composers, and Ludwig had done uh, Black Panther. So he's done some hard hitting stuff. Black Panther. He did Tenet for mm. Christopher Nolan Fantastic as well, uh, and then he's done Creed, the boxing movie one and two. But then mm-hmm. Joseph did uh, Creed three, and he's doing uh, Oppenheimer, which is Nolan's new film that's coming out in July or something. So they must work quite a bit together because um, I saw on the score on the um, the thumbnail that Lud- uh, Ludwig still gets credit for this one obviously you know he's written the main theme but he must be still co-writing some of the tracks or using the inspiration of the first two they've still obviously credited him uh but it sounds like they're a a great team doing some really great scores Mm. together or you know at least working together um one thing i found interesting because they did um they recorded uh season two the because it was in COVID, so the first one had a seventy-piece mm. orchestra uh, that they just do in, in LA with probably your typical uh, ring-in 
uh, uh, orchestra for scores and stuff, but the second one they only had a yeah. forty piece. The typical ring in incredible musicians. Yeah, oh, of, of the course. World. Yeah, the ring in um, who probably don't <laughs> like even the best of the best. They wouldn't even practice it. They just go in and sight read, and it'd be freaking awesome. Uh, but it's then pretty incredible. The second season was during COVID, so they only had a forty piece orchestra. Mm. And one thing I haven't done since I read that is actually compare the two to see if you notice the difference in sound. They may have like double recorded them and things like that to kind of hide the facts, mm. but um, I'd be interested and, you know, I think I'd recommend you doing the same is go listen to season one and two and just see if you can tell the vibe. One thing, so I was watching, um, I think it was episode three or four of season two today and at one point I was listening to the score and I was like, that sounds a bit like a library to me. There was just a certain section. Interesting. And, yeah, that I was like, it sounded a bit library music, a bit almost too pristine and that's why I started doing some more research because I just wanted to see it like this high budget for a for a TV show are they just using library score uh, library orchestras and just doing it on a computer but then I went back and watched the next episode after that and I was like no that was obviously just something in that particular mm. cue that was making it's- me feel a bit like oh that's a bit too pristine and I don't know, not a yeah. bit lifeless. It's interesting you say that because yeah. um, there could be a few reasons for that. One is that it could have been just a moment that they ran out of time for on the scoring stage, which does happen. Possibly. It does happen. Yeah. When you book an orchestra, it's often in like a three-hour session and um, uh, I know there's a lot of, especially in America, there's a lot of unions around the orchestras and the recording sessions, so you've got to be very strict with time. So um it's very hard to ask them, hey, do you mind 70 people? Do you mind just staying back five minutes? Yeah, He's yeah, got yeah. one more. Yeah. You know, it's quite hard to do. But also sometimes um, once you've done the recording session and you're already in the mix, all of a sudden the, the creation creative team say, hey, we need this other track that we haven't gotten written yet. Yeah. So would you mind us writing us one more track? And then certain tracks will sneak through with just library mock-ups or computer-generated yeah, orchestras, okay. um, so which it might do sound been. really good, so, oh, but it yeah. may have just been something that came out after the yeah. recording session and then, you know, we're not going to pull the orchestra back for, you know, a, a minute and a half cue. Yeah. And I, I, I ha- there's been a couple of scores in the past that I have spotted. I'm like, hmm, the strings sound a bit different in this one cue, this one piece of music. Yeah. Um, what's going on there? And I've heard in composer interviews um, talking about writing right up, uh, writing music right up till the moment where they're actually like wanting to export the film. Yeah. And they're still writing music like the night before because, you know, they made some edits and they're now the mu- music doesn't fit and they need to quickly whip something up. Um, and obviously if you're, you know, if you're writing music on a Thursday night and they need to export the score of uh, the film out you on a Friday. Yeah, can't record a, an orchestra. There's not much time to record yeah. an orchestra yeah. in there. <laughs> Call so. them up at midnight. Hey, guys, we've got to get in the studio. <laughs> yeah. Do you all, mind? I hope you haven't yeah. had a big night. but uh, <laughs> And all 70 of them are like, yeah, sweet. <laughs> At midnight. I can't even imagine coordinating that. I mean, back when I played in bands, just coordinating three other people to go to a rehearsal was hard <laughs> enough, let alone 70 musicians. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that's a good point. And actually there's a good chance, like it was an action scene and stuff, that that was a cue that they were like, you know, mm. they whipped it up later or whatever. So well, that's a good good um, little insight there you're giving me. Um, mm. I, I like because I, I definitely, there's so many shows out there that um, when I'm watching I'm like, Clearly, it's just a library, you know. Um, but you know, listening back to a lot of the other uh, tracks on the albums, and and even just within the next episode, I was like, nah, it's in your head, or so it must have <laughs> been that particular cue that was a bit funky that didn't feel right. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, that to tell me, this is really interesting because I have heard um, from a few filmmaking friends, they love to talk about the technology that they use to film the Mandalorian. From the from an image point of view, so the vision side of it. Yes. Oh, yes. And I, I don't know much about it, but I know you know a bit about it. So I want to know um, a little bit about these projection screens. Oh, uh, hey, hey, we've got another one. Uh, oh man, that that's is hilarious. so good. I think Didn't one of my batteries it, is. Yeah, that must dodgy. be dead. Maybe that was one I gave you because that lasted uh, about uh, what twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, should we? When this is where we put the elevator music in. Dum da dum da dum dum da dum dum dum. Oh, that's oh, this is so good, mate. I thought we were going to be in the clear from dead battery vibes. Just chuck the one you had in before. 
Well, you're on your holding screen. Good thing you're using. All right, so we're back. Oh, but you I just need to refocus myself. <laughs> <laughs> Am I in focus? Yeah. I think I'm in focus. Good enough. Let me just double check. Um, Good enough. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I suggest, mate, you got to watch. So on the Disney uh, Disney streaming service, they've got a making of The Mandalorian. And I see that they've actually got one for season two as well. But I definitely mm. recommend you watching The Making of because they uh, – and which – I've heard there's one in Melbourne now, one of the even bigger one, but they built a room which has just LED panels in a circle. So they have a bit of a doorway, but they have LED panels that go all the way around a circle and then a roof of LED panels. So we're talking like, you know, modern video screens like you'd see at a concert and stuff. So it's not projected. Yep. And what they You're saying there's no gaps. So the whole thing is just like no a gaps. continuous screen. Yeah all the way around, full 360, except for one little opening, which I think they might even be able little to close doorway, it. like the Truman Show? Well, I saw, so, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they actually watched the video of um, Ludwig, uh, how do you say his name again? Ludwig. Um, got, Goranson. Goranson, uh, yep. I could be hacking that. I'm no, no, sorry, Ludwig, yeah, if you're yeah, watching yeah. this. So there's a um, video of him playing on the set, playing guitar along with the track and then the doors close. And so maybe they can shut it off. So it's more 360 degrees, which makes sense. So the reason they do this, mm. and I'm not sure if they had the problem before they came up with the solution, but so, you know, Mandalorian, his whole suit is shiny, but mostly his helmet is just one giant reflective dome. And I, I have a feeling I've got to go back and watch it again. Cause it was so interesting, but they basically like, we can't use green screen or interesting. the issue with green screen, so if they green screened everything, when they put the fake backgrounds in, there'll be no reflections on his helmet. And what would be reflecting off his helmet is lights and the sound team, the boom, whatever. Well, he wouldn't have a boom because his helmet would have a microphone. But they discovered that there was going to be an issue. And what they do, I think, in the past is get the image that they've put behind him and they... CGI place it on his head and it would just take mm. forever to do that kind of stuff. And so they came up with a solution that this projector room, they project the whole scene behind him. So the mountains, the sky, including above. So the whole thing is the, the, the sky or whatever, but that, because that is the lighting as well, you get this sense of like natural lighting. So if there's a sunset mm. over here, it's being projected then it and get shows all those up. Colors. Yeah, you get all those colors all the, on his yeah. helmet and it all feels natural and, and they can change. So they don't have to go to the actual desert. They They'd do have not. have to cart all the gear to the no. desert and get everyone out there in the dust. No. So they'd obviously put a bucket load of sand on the ground or, you know, build some sort of set for him or whatever he's riding or whatever. He'll be sitting on a rock. They'd build the rock face and then behind yep. him is just a projected image. And what is cool about this is they have – on the camera, they have a little uh, a ball or a sensor. They have cameras everywhere that are picking up where in space the camera is, and so they have so that you get this parallax effect. So it's I'm trying to not be too technical, but if a camera, if there's a person here and the camera is here moving, the perception of the world moving behind him, if it's close to him, it wouldn't move that much, or is it a lot? It would move a lot, but if it's further back the stuff behind moves slower than what's in front. Does that make sense? Yep. So if you've ever, ever held a camera and you're kind of moving around, you get the parallax sensation of things are moving at different paces behind him. So the way they work that out and they use uh, gaming computer sort of generated backgrounds that when he wow. moves behind him, the picture actually moves as well in relation to the way the camera's moving and the speed. So they're basically tracking in 3D the camera movements and then the background moves according to how the camera moves. So you mm. still get that real Very parallax cool. vibe. It's like, watch, I'm probably not explaining it well, but just watch it because it is just phenomenal. And they actually, I saw they've built. So just like Mandalorian BTS behind the scenes? Yes. I'm sure it'll uh, show up. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it'll be easy to find. Yeah. If you just search for Mandalorian, it'll pop up. Um, but they've now built one here in Australia as well. So they've they've built the same thing. Mm. And they I think they use it for a whole bunch of stuff. It, I don't think they were the original using that technology in a way. As in, I remember 
what's there was a movie with um, Tom Cruise where it's him is it Oblivion where him and there's one other woman movie. or something and he's and he's sitting in his little space pod or whatever on this planet and all the screens outside the window or sorry all the location or the clouds outside his windows are just projectors but they I think they use projectors for that not LED mm-hmm. screens but they got the same thing where literally they could just film all day long and have this beautiful sunset and not worry about it. It's the same Mandalorian. They didn't have to wait for time of day. They That's have a good point. Half an hour window to shoot and then have to wait for the next sunset, you know? Yeah. Because so, anyone who's tried to take a photo of the sunset, uh, you, you get like a couple of moments where the sunset is like perfect. Mm. And then if you missed it, you missed it. And imagine trying to film a scene, like a whole scene, and you, you want 10 minutes or 15 minutes or to exist at sunset. Yeah. Um, you kind of got one take. Yeah. The, but the thing about shooting a movie, or a TV show is um, each time you get another camera angle, you're yeah. resetting the whole thing. Yeah. So what might appear to be a 10-minute scene or a five-minute scene in the actual edit in the final product may have taken a handful of hours to actually shoot. Yeah, and they, they can then also rotate the background, do whatever they want with it. So if they feel like they want the light to be a bit better for the other person, like the, the reverse mm. shot, they can just adjust a little bit rotate oh, around this. or do whatever they want with it because it's not they're not I, I limited by it. You know? I want one back here. I want one behind yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I want this like. <laughs> Have you seen actually um, there's a funny uh, video where a guy is in doing MMA fighting but he's in – have you seen that clip? And he's in a no. Zoom meeting. He's got a laptop attached to himself with a, a green screen that's pretending to put an, like his office behind him but then he's – in the middle of an MA, MMA fight and there's a guy beating him up and all the, all the people in the meeting are seeing his face in his office just getting punched and stuff. It's just oh. the weirdest thing. Of, like, is that, you know, so you could do that or, you know, mm. get yourself, like your backdrop looks almost fake with your all your expensive keyboards, you know. You could just be faking yeah. that right now. I'm just in my bedroom really. I don't have any of this stuff. It's yeah. just all. Just a white room. All added on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so the one other benefit I guess of having that, uh, setup is sound, right? So let's take it back to sound is again, like we were talking about with Avatar and the fact that they, they would have been shooting mostly on or a lot of it in green screens and studios and stuff. Uh, this was a, again, the same deal and they probably had less fans and things because there's not lights or other stuff, but the, fortunately for Mandalorian himself, he would have had a microphone right in his helmet. And so they can get nice, clear audio for him. Mm. But the set itself is just, what would be, reasonably quiet although maybe the screens uh, the led screens i've worked with never had big fans in them or anything like that but you have a great it would definitely set. be quiet quieter and more manageable than being out in the desert with the wind and yeah. all the other elements going yeah. on for sure for sure because yeah. one of the one of the biggest challenges for audio is wind not only the sound of the wind passing the microphone giving you the sound but also um like the actors speaking, the sound gets caught in the wind. You, you probably don't think of it much, but, you know, when the wind blows, say you're at a music festival, I'm sure yeah. this can relate to most gonna people. I was going to say this example. <laughs> and you're like far away from the screen and there's a windy day and all of a sudden the sound sort of comes and goes. It sort of sounds good and then it sounds really thin and like trebly and then it comes back again. Um, it's often because of the wind yeah. is blowing the sound particles Um the vibrations around. Yeah. Um, and I'm, it's much the same when you're recording dialogue or recording audio. Um, if I'm outside and I've got a microphone here also and it starts wi- being really windy, you bo- you're going to get both the, bl- the wind sound on the microphone and the l- l- you know, lose some of the, the warmth or the body of yeah. the tone of the person talking. So yeah. the studio would be a lot more controlled in that respect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I definitely recommend Which, which is actually tr- true. Like the sound of this show is it is very clean. Like the dialogue is very clean. All the sound effects are all very um, detailed. Um, when I watched it, I didn't think it's done so well that it, it, my my brain didn't grab a hold of it yeah, you know, when I, I was watching I, it. Had, I was obsessed obviously with the music because I can't watch anything without focusing in on the music. Yeah, it's yeah. just the way I'm wired. But I, I remember thinking to myself, hey, it's just it's all just really good. Like it's nothing to fault here. Yeah. And and know? that's the one thing about say the visuals and like seeing the reflections on his helmet. 
I saw all that and I'm just like, it looks stunning. Like the lighting and mm. cause they can manipulate the color. So every location and the good thing with Star Wars is they're on different planets. So a planet might have multiple suns and you can't recreate multiple suns reflecting off his helmet without doing that digitally, mm. right? Cause we only have one sun. You could maybe That's set up point. extra lights, but they, they're, you know, they're in different universes. Their skies might be different colors based off whatever, everything. Like mm. I'm not a scientist, so I couldn't tell you why their <laughs> planets would look different. But, you know, the original Star Wars, they obviously put a second moon in and things like that. Um, I'm assuming they did that after the fact. But most of the locations are very much, you, you know, just odd places on Earth because that's the best they could do or desert or you know, even the forest, nothing, none of that is really different to earth, but they could make it feel different in different, you know, different ways by adding a second moon or whatever. But the good mm. thing with using these projector screens is they really could make any moment feel different or skies feel different or just more beautiful because they had the ability to just CGI the best looking skies they wanted or just cool atmospheres and stuff. So, um, but yeah, seeing like the reflections on his helmet and things, it did look stunning. Like, I do remember seeing his helmet and just noticing all the color on it and being amazed by it, but not, I never knew how it was done. So when I watched this documentary on it, it just blew mm. me away. And I was like, that makes so much sense that yeah. it, it all just glued together. You know, the imagery all worked so well because you got, you know, the background light was clearly reflecting beautifully off him. And I wouldn't have even known how they did that if I didn't find out, you know. Yeah. I think also if you've ever watched behind the scenes of um, films being made where there is a lot of CGI, a lot of computer-generated graphics, um, it's often that actors are acting in front of a green screen or a blue screen. They might choose a different colour based on different technical reasons. But um, it, it doesn't give much for the actors to sort of bounce off yeah. and perform off as well. Like I, I remember watching um, some behind the scenes of The Great Gatsby and and then realising how much of everything that you're seeing doesn't exist. It's just green screens and they walk up these steps and everything else is green screen but they're acting like they're at this giant palace and it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then you watch the before and after, there's some great sort of um, side by side where this is what the camera saw and this is after the um, animation team finished with it yeah. and it's pretty mind-blowing if you haven't seen it yeah um but i imagine that would be very hard on the actors yeah um and also on the lighting team as well and everyone else who's creating the look to go i'm imagining that there will be this here so i need to do this because of what that might look like yeah yeah they're actually responding to a backdrop so they are actually seeing the backdrop in this new technology with the screen they are actually being able to feel like they're in the environment that they're in mm. so Imagine that's a lot easier to act in. Yeah, um, yeah, that's for cool. sure. Um, jumping back to the score just for a second, because I, I, you were telling me about something earlier, and it fascinated me about some of the sounds that um, Ludwig, like the way that he approaches the sounds in his score, and he always likes to have something that's to do with the film or the TV show that he's working on, to integrate into the into the score. And what sounds did you pick out from the um, the Mandalorian that he's sort of Oh, used I, as, as samples, you know? I definitely didn't pick it out, mate. I Again, I saw the interview with him where he explained that. So he, as I said, he um, composed Creed 1 and 2 and they were boxing movies and he was saying that like that movie, so he, he records uh, things that are a part of the film and brings them into the scores you're saying. like So for that he recorded boxes, punching boxing bags. He recorded things like the ropes of the, the boxing ring and he used those as percussive elements within his score. Oh, interesting. And I find – and and so he did the same. So in Mandalorian he got um, the Ma Mandalorian's boots and, you know, made sounds with that, obviously stomping on the ground and doing other things like that. But I, I find that kind of stuff interesting in the sense that, as I said, I didn't pick any of that stuff. So I, I haven't extensively listened to the score outside of the show. Uh, so it is a bit harder – you know, I know you love to just study a score and I'm getting more into it because of you. Like I'll chuck on, you know, a bunch of Hans Zimmer scores and a few other scores that I love just uh, when I'm in a score mood or I listen to Two Way um, who do sort of trailer tracks and stuff. But I don't tend to just sit 
and meditate on them like you do. And maybe <laughs> I would have heard them and I now am yeah. going to go back and listen to for that stuff. I'm going to I'm going to go back and listen to that sort of stuff yeah. as well. Yeah. But I, I find like stuff like that to me is there a part of it and as a composer yourself, do you think a part of that obviously the the boxing things makes a bit more sense if you've got an action scene mm. Maybe having some boxing sounds as percussion because of its nature could be quite percussive. But I feel yep. like, no offense to Ludwig and other composers like it, is that just to so they've got a cool story to share when they get interviewed about the 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 score that they're like, oh well, I, you know, it seems like a for me a kind of thing <laughs> you just do so you could say, well, that's how we created that sound, or oh well, the one thing we did that was cool that was different to everyone else is we got prop sets and turned them into sounds, you know. I look. You're probably not wrong a little <laughs> bit there. I, I think I think there's there's layers to that answer. I would I would speculate, and I don't know because, um, but I would speculate that there there is a little bit of the story because it's fun to make a story. Yeah. I think it's also um, when you're working with um, big directors and producers, you know, you that they, they want to know that you're doing a little bit more than just dialing up your favorite sounds on the computer. Yeah. There's a bit, bit of that like creation yeah. side, like what are they getting that's unique to their film? What are you going to give them that's a little bit yeah. special that you're not going to use on other projects? That's that's their sounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also think that making sounds at the start of a project is almost like justified procrastination <laughs> because it's, it's like writing music um, can be quite daunting, mm. writing music to a film where you're – going to write music and deliver it to a creative team and they're going to say we love it or we don't love it or change this or you're completely wrong and that's not what we're after is quite daunting. And, you know, hear, hearing composers talk about it in interviews, there, there is a procrastination period of like but it's not all procrastination. A lot of it is thinking it yeah, and yeah. Letting, letting the ideas marinate. And I've heard of other composers creating samples as a way of just – giving themselves time to get in amongst this, um, the experience of this film yeah, yeah. to let the ideas come. And then they have some unique sounds that inspire them that are fresh because also remember like, you know, strings and orchestras and, and certain synth sounds have been used so many times. Mm. You know, when you sit down at the keyboard and you play something and it, it sounds like the thing that you just did but you can't use those notes because that's that film. Yeah, yeah. There's something about new sounds on um, that sort of. Um, Can I add a fun help? fourth? Yeah. Please. Can I add a fun fourth? Please do. Uh, that they're, they're justifying their. So he was brought on uh, in pre-production, <laughs> justifying their yeah. wage and time. Like I know some of these guys work on these films for a year, and they'll be like right there at pre-production. So when they're drawing the imagery, you know, drawing um, not the. Um, Oh, they'll just be like creating the artwork for what the spaceships could look like and all that sort of stuff and very much in the the script might be written but it's like what does this look like? You know, the the playbook I guess you could call it of what the film is. Mm. So the composer's like, yeah, and we're going to add the sounds of his boots. In it. You know, like I, it could be just that thing of almost justifying the exorbitant. The sales pitch. Yeah, the, in, in the exorbitant <laughs> amount of money and the time that it's put in. It's like, well, let's add. And I think your point's even just saying like sounds that are unique to this production and you know that and that I think is a great selling point and you would bring I think uh directors and producers would probably lap that stuff up right if you were bringing in yeah. a bunch of elements that were really unique to their project um it's also yeah. fun yeah, I mean you're right all, it is. all the projects yeah. all the projects that I've worked on I've always wanted to make something some sound of my own that I, I've been able to bring into it yeah and sometimes they're, they're strange sounds like you'd be surprised. This the like I I worked on a fashion. Um, I made some music for a fashion shoot. Um, so it was um, just original composition for to go against like a fashion video, and the inspiration for it was sort of nature and all of these crazy hairdos built with twigs and all this stuff through the thing and yeah. look birds nesty and stuff and it was pretty crazy yeah. hairdos yeah. like. Um, and so I went out and grabbed, like snapped off some bushes, um, from a tree and stuff. And I would do percussion just using branches, hitting it against my kitchen bench to get like a bit of the sort of percussive elements that I wanted to use. And I wanted to channel in nature. So, um, and even like crunching leaves yeah, and, and different things, different nature elements that I could mix into the other sounds that I had. And did I need to? No, probably not. 
Yeah. Did it improve the piece of music? Maybe a little bit. Was it fun? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's true. So, and, and so maybe it is, you know, yeah. maybe that's the element. Yeah, and now you've got the cool story it. to tell, right? Like at the end of the day, people well, listening to that probably thought it was just shakers and other things like that. Be like, now you've got a cool yeah. story to tell on your podcast. You know, That's right. Yeah, yeah. coming I'm back to your first point, so. the cool story. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I love that. That's so um, good. Well, I think we've found our way to um, Ben's top tip for the, for the um, episode. Yeah, okay. I want to know if there is anyone out there who um, hasn't watched any Star Wars, which, uh, maybe, you know, when I, when I was uh, in my 20s, I would have thought to myself, who hasn't watched Star Wars? But it's a strange world we live in these days and there could be some peculiar people out there who haven't watched any. Um, but I would love to know what order, because there's so many, so many sort of episodes now, movies and whatnot, what order should I watch the Star Wars episode films. If I had never seen any episodes before, what would your be be your recommendation? Yeah, okay. So I heard um, a while back that there was there was this formula for any newbies to start watching the film. So let's just talk like we're an just, official an official formula. Uh, it's not an official formula. So it was uh, it came up. I, I had to write this down. Ernst Ryder is the guy's name, or well, that was his forum name. So he's okay. in a Star Wars yep. forum, and he was the first to say this. And it obviously blew up because everyone was like, that sounds great. So this was before all the new films, as in we're talking, so at this point, four, five, and six, so the originals were out, and one, two, and three. So George Lucas's, this is pre-Disney, um, so the six. So this was written then, but I still think it, it could a- apply. So we're not talking mm-hmm. about any of the extra shows. So there's like Clone Wars shows. If you want to know what the best order to watch all that stuff in, you really just Google it on the internet but because there's so many offsprings of things and uh, animated series, all that kind of stuff. So if we're talking mm. just the main films, which there's, what, nine of them now? Yeah, nine of them. Mm-hmm. So we're going to uh, – I'll talk about the extras later. But what you want to do is to get the true Star Wars experience as a, a newbie is you want to start from four, which is A New Hope, and that's the one that everyone saw – the first time that blew everyone's minds and maybe these days it may not blow your mind as much. But so that was the first one they actually released. They released, yes. It was actually it was actually episode four in the story. Yes, episode four in the story and that is, uh, you know, featuring Luke Skywalker. Uh, so A New Hope start and then next you go on to the next one after that. So episode five, which is The Empire Strikes Back, which most people would say, I don't think George Lucas actually directed that one. Most people say that that's the best mm. Star Wars, or at least it was the best. It was a know. good one. Yeah, I think everyone sort of claims, and I like I loved it. I thought it was, yeah, it definitely had a different vibe to the first one. So you go four, five, so Empire Strikes Back next, and then you go back to episode one, which is we're skipping the last one of that first generation, which was, so the last one was Return of the Jedi. Um and so, which was technically episode six. So yes. So you're saying we're four, watching episode four and five, five which are the first yep. two ever released. Yeah. And, and then, then there was back. the six, yep. but we're we going to skip, skip that, that and yep. put that later. Yep. We should probably almost okay. put this on the screen so we can see. But no, yeah, you explain yeah. it well. So you go back to the Phantom Menace. So this is going back and telling Darth Vader's story, right? Mm-hmm. And so most, uh, some people, if you ask, they'd say skip episode one, the Phantom Menace, because. There's a lot of fluff. It's not important to the story. There's some really annoying characters in there, one being Jar Jar Binks. But I would say still watch it. And I was one of those people that was like, I still loved it because that for me was like I'd already loved the first three. I was growing up and then they brought those out. And I'm like, sweet, we get modern day Star Wars. Uh, but there's <laughs> there's a, like some amazing score in there, like the battle scenes at the end with – um. Uh, Darth Maul and his double lightsaber was just yeah. phenomenal. And the dun, 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 oh, just so good. Great music. Great John music. Williams. So, yep. So we go four, five, back to one, then just go one, two, three. So we see the story of Darth Vader. And then you go six. Which was the Phantom Menace. Yeah, sorry, the, the Phantom Attack Menace. of the Clones. Yes, and Revenge of the Sith. So that's. Thank you. Yep. So yep. four, five. One, two, three, then we go to six. So we go to Return of the Jedi. 
And that... This is not confusing at all. I know. It, it is confusing. But look it up. <laughs> if you need to look it up to remember you, it's Ernst Ryder. But then we get to see the completion or we get to see how it kind of all, that all wraps up and ends a bit. And then after that, just go through the Disneys. So The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker. And so they're the three mm. newer ones. And then after that, there's the two side movies. So there's obviously the side shows. So there's Obi-Wan and Boba Fett yep. and Mandalorian. But then you go see Solo, the Star Wars story, which Solo is about Han Solo. So at that point, we've already met Han Solo. This is his backstory. And then there's also Rogue One, uh, also called Rogue One, a Star Wars story. And that is actually in between the original three and the new three. But it's not... New three? Uh, sorry. Number six? Sorry. So that's in between four, five, six and one, two, three. So I, it's definitely not important to see it in between those. I think let's not muddy it up. Mm -hmm. um, this is what I read. Like I went back and looked up who like came up with this form or this, I don't know what you call it. Uh, and when I saw it, the, uh, the person commenting on this, uh, on Ernst Ryder's order said that it's save those till later. Cause obviously you're still yeah. then going back and, and it gives you some extra sort of like fills in a few gaps, but it's not vital to the kind of core nine films that we all know yeah. and love. So do we yeah. need to repeat it? I don't think we do. If you need to look it up, I don't think we need Ernst to, I don't Rider's think we order. Uh, but I definitely yeah. think, and I, I like looking back when I heard about this, you look back and you go, yeah, actually that for any newbie, that is definitely the best way to go about it. You get, you know, great back. Like it's, you almost have in the, so once you've started seeing the the original four, three, well, the original two, I guess, because we said four or five, you get to kind of go, oh, we're going to go to the backstory. You get the backstory and then you get this final big ending with six. Um, and yeah. then obviously we tack on the last, the latest three that um, Disney brought out because, you know, they're not important to the course original sort of six under George they're Lucas. They're just an extra fun. But they're just so much fun, fun aren't they? Yeah. Like. They yeah, are. they're just great stories, yeah. great characters. Like all the new additional characters are so good. The new creatures they come up with, like the cameos in it. Like because that's the one great thing about Star Wars and every interview you see with all the the latest films is there's so many actors that are like that Star Wars is the reason I became an actor and to be mm -hmm. in one is just like the pinnacle of my career. Um, <laughs> so it's just, yeah, great, great to, great to watch. So... That's my yeah. uh, top tip. Hopefully it didn't nice. confuse too many people. And if you haven't seen Star Wars, you're an idiot. Go and watch it. Um, That's a bit harsh. All right. Maybe people just were recently born. Well, maybe not recently born, but maybe they're younger people that that I'll, they went around when The New Hope and stuff was released. Yeah, know, but I wasn't maybe. around, was I? Like how I would have been very small when they came out. That's true. In fact, That's I don't think point. I was born for the, for, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, a knowledge nerd when it comes to Star Wars, but I'm just a very avid fan. A movie lover. Movie lover. Yeah. Anything quality. Yeah. And as you said, like sci-fi, I just, I'm a huge sci-fi fan because I think the idea that like for the soundies and stuff, everything's come out of someone's imagination. Like I, you know, mm. a great drama that's just captivating script and amazing acting is great, but I like when whole bunch of people get in a room or, you know, particularly it starts with one person writing it, but it's like they write this thing, but then a whole team of people come up with like what it looks like and what it sounds like and, you know, the score, like, yeah. It's it a just, lot of great sound yeah. opportunity yeah. in sci-fi. Yeah. Cause, and it's often that it's it's either set at a different time or on a different world or different things like that. So there's a lot of playfulness that can happen yeah. from a sound perspective. Yeah. So good. Um, and scores, are, uh, the music is often um, – there's often more risk taken into yeah, for sure. um, in, musically from the sound or the writing in sci-fi compared to other genres. Yeah. And again, Not like always don't come at me, your comedy guys <laughs> and your action guys, but um, sci-fi is where it's at yeah. when it comes to music. Yeah. Um, well, let's see if we, maybe we uh, get anyone listening to tell us if we're wrong because I'm sure they will. But uh, you've got two sci-fi fans here, so. Hopefully we don't. We, we'll try and uh, see a broad range of 
content and talk about that. Uh, so we'll keep yeah, it. we'll keep it balanced. Yeah, that's it. All right, mate. Well, it's been this fun. fun, mate. And we should actually we should have a binge session in my studio, especially when I go to like Dolby Atmos, and we should just watch all the Star Wars. That'd be great. That'd be a that'd long. Be a that, how many? That would be. That would days. be a long. <laughs> Days we'd have to have yeah, a weekend. That would it probably would be. Probably have to take like two weeks off work yeah. and just like that. What if be it. what if we just watch the latest ones? Dolby Atmos. We'll watch the because I'll be mixed in Dolby Atmos. We could watch the yeah. latest three or something. Anyway, yeah, no, that'd be fun. All right, mate. It's been great right. to chat sci-fi with you. I've loved it. Absolutely. All right, we'll cool. see you soon, eh? Alrighty, see ya.